So this evening's discussion is on Buddhism and wabi-sabi. And um, wabi-sabi is a term that one comes across in Japanese culture that has a plethora of implications. And it's interesting, I, I just read a article on wabi-sabi from a Japanese perspective, and there's a consensus in Japan that nobody outside of Japan can possibly understand wabi-sabi. So if you don't get it, they're right. If you do get it, they're wrong, just so you're aware of that. Usually it's associated with a particular type of aesthetic and its origins are Taoist and Buddhist, and its development in Japan permeates the culture in ways that are both subtle and profound. And this is a discussion that I originally presented several years ago. Does anybody remember when I presented it? A couple of people do. Um, but I made some revisions um, because I, you can't leave anything alone. And it, to reflect a slightly different perspective than the perspective I took previously, although for the most part it's the same. But I enjoy topics like this, this topic like unwabi-sabi in Japanese culture, not just because it's Japanese culture, which is you know something that I, I've, I've taught culture history, Japanese culture history, but I enjoy it because it demonstrates how philosophy permeates culture. And I think that we don't recognize that often enough. We look at, at, at politics and we look at all sorts of other aspects, phenomena in our lives and how they permeate culture. But philosophy and, and practices of Buddhist teaching come alive in wabi-sabi and the social interactions, as well as individual practices. Um, and so looking at examples of that in Japanese culture provides us a way to realize how can these teachings, these Buddhist teachings, these Taoists, these Confucian teachings, etc., how do they take, how do they manifest in our lives? Now, and, and here I just want to make a really quick statement, and that is, this is not to say that I anticipate that Wabi Sabi is going to take America by storm, because I suspect that outside of the people in this room at the end of the presentation, and, you know, a few, maybe thousand of people in the United States will have any idea what Wabi Sabi is, so it's not going to be a, a really big deal. On the other hand, I think it, it shows us a, a, an example of how philosophy and practices come to life in everyday life in ways that can be really meaningful. Um, and most specifically, the concept is of wabi-sabi is one that we should learn to embrace for reasons that will become apparent during the presentations. So wabi-sabi's origins are found in Taoist Buddhist teachings and service best in our daily lives today. Ooh. Why is this not? There we go. Okay, so let's start with a, a few definitions of wabi sabi. Some of the most meaningful concepts in both Buddhist and Japanese culture are difficult to describe in words. And many books and articles about, about wabi sabi start with the disclaimer that the phrase cannot be explained with words. Because tonight I'll use both words and images, and hopefully in a way that can be better understood. So if we look at the term wabi per se, it's often um, translated as the elegant beauty of humble simplicity. All things are imperfect. Keep that in mind, all things are imperfect. The term wabi only appeared in the 15th century to designate a new aesthetic sensibility closely related to the tea ceremony, which referred to the general atmosphere and to the objects used during this formal service. The definition of wabi can be traced back to the terms loneliness or melancholy, to the appreciation of a serene life far from the urban hustle and bustle during that period of time. And today I see it as a form of conscious intent to recapture a more sustainable way of life, a positive response to our throwaway culture. And I think that this is one of the ways that we can, we can actually embody 
some of the teachings of Wabi Sabi. Sabi is the passing of time and the subsequent deterioration that all things are impermanent. The second part, Sabi, is said to date back to the 8th century when it was used to designate desolation in a poetic way. From the 12th century, the term evolved and referred more precisely to the delightful contemplation of what is old and worn. And considering the age of many of us here, we contemplate uh, being old and worn uh, quite often. Uh, it was also used to talk about the beauty of faded or withered things. Sabi can also mean old and elegant, being rusty with an untranslatable impression of peacefulness. Need I mention how this, how the, the how this arises, this meaning of wabi-sabi, arises from Buddhist teachings. Taken together, both life and art are beautiful, not because they are perfect and eternal, but because they are imperfect and fleeting. Stop and think about that. Both life and art are beautiful, not because they are perfect and eternal, but because they are imperfect and fleeting. This sort of drops things on its head compared to the way we often uh, perceive these things. And I make mention to the Western perception of art in a, in a few moments. Donald Keane observed in the book entitled The Pleasures of Japanese Literature, that the Japanese sense of beauty has long sharply differed from its Western counterpart. It's been dominated by a love of irregularity rather than symmetry, the impermanent rather than the eternal, and the simpler rather than the ornate. The reason owes nothing to climate or genetics, added Keane, but is the result of actions of writers, painters, and theorists who had actively shaped the sense of beauty of their nation. For Japanese people, wabi-sabi is a feeling more than a concept. And that's important to keep in mind. It's a feeling more than a concept that can be found in classical Japanese aesthetics, flower arrangement, literature, philosophy, poetry, tea ceremonies, Zen gardens, etc. Wabi-sabi goes against the contemporary overconsumption, but also encourages simplicity and authenticity in everything. The origin of the concept, it originated in Taoism during China's Song Dynasty, 960 to 1279. And one of the writers, whose last name is Juniper, surmises that Wabi Sabi suggests such qualities as impermanence, humility, asymmetry, and imperfection. These underlying principles are diametrically opposed to those, to those of their Western counterparts whose values are rooted in a Hellenic worldview that values permanence, grandeur, symmetry, symmetry and perfection. There's the distinction. The worldview that we typically have in this room is of the Hellenic notion that looks at permanence, grandeur, symmetry, and perfection, that extols those virtues. Whereas wabi-sabi, you could say, is really the opposite of those, of those qualities. <clears throat> Yin and Yang. Before being passed, so I, I mentioned it originated in Taoism during China's uh, Song Dynasty. But before being passed into Zen Buddhism, Wabi Sabi was originally seen as an austere, restrained form of appreciation. It's an intuitive appreciation of the transient beauty in the physical world that reflects the irreversible flow of life in the spiritual world. Is it, an, it is an understated beauty that exists in the modest, rustic, imperfect, and even decayed, an aesthetic sensibility that finds a melancholic beauty in the impermanence of all things. I should emphasize here that the term melancholy being used means pensive, reflective, or contemplation rather than sadness or gloom. I think when we hear this term melancholy, we, we often think of it as something which is sad and gloomy uh, but and and that's a more recent when i say recent a more contemporary use of the term melancholy but the more tra the traditional i shouldn't say traditional the 
original term of melancholy was that which is pensive reflection or contemplative. Um, as a side note, the quality and meaning of melancholy, uh, pensive reflective or, con or contemplation are one of the reasons that I really appreciate Japanese culture and Portuguese culture, because both cultures seem to embrace that idea of, of life. As a matter of fact, the term, if you're making a toast in Portugal, it's, um, well, if it's the Brazilian Portuguese, it's saúde. And saúde literally is to remember in a reflective way those who have brought us to where we are and to think about what life was like looking at life now and looking at how those that brought us here that, that we are what we are now based upon those that have brought us here. That's melancholy in the Portuguese concept. Um, in, in North America, I think we interpret it as in, in sort of a ne negative way rather than a positive and facilitating way. <clears throat> because melancholy, without a doubt, is part of wabi-sabi. The Buddhist origins of wabi-sabi are really rather interesting and, and uh, I find this especially compelling. There's the idea of mujo, and mujo is anicca, impermanence. Um, shogyo mujo, all there is in the world is forever changing constantly. Nothing in the universe is stationary. This is true of the physical environment and our emotions, our thoughts, identity, which are always flowing in a time <clears throat> continuum. So this idea of mujo or anicca <clears throat> of impermanence, I think is, is one of the things that sort of drives us crazy. Mm -hmm. um, when, I, when people say, I can't meditate because my thoughts are going all over the place. Well, yeah, <laughs> that's the way life is. <laughs> and, and so learning to meditate is learning not how to harness that, because that implies you're restraining it in some way, but learning how to flow with it. That's a really big distinction that I think that we should make. Another way in which wabi-sabi is related to uh, Buddhism is through shunyata, void of self-existing nature, emptiness or the absence of self-nature. Shunyata may be thought of as a physical and mental state that we as humans can reach when we feel things just as they are right now in the present period. That is, our minds are not adding anything at all to reality or illuminating thing whatsoever from it. That's one of the difficult things that we have. Our minds are continually adding to whatever we see around us. It, it's natural. I mean, that's part of... We, uh, um, what's his name? Wes Nesker, in his book uh, titled, um, what was it? Um, Buddha Nature, talks about how human beings would not have evolved to become Homo sapiens if we'd been Buddhists. <laughs> because we're continually contriving and altering our environments in ways that would, that as Buddhists, we try not to do. We try to go with the flow more, whereas um, Homo sapiens were, well, even before Homo sapiens, we go back to Homo erectus, etc. We were altering our environments in, in very real ways. Um, so, shunyata is thought of as a physical and mental state that we humans can reach when we feel things just as they are right now in the present period. That is, our minds are not adding anything at all to reality or illuminating anything whatsoever from it. Human ego tends to come between us and reality, leaving no room for shunyata without our intent to change that state. And that's an important point. And the other third way is ku. You'll notice there's two kus, but one is ku and the other is ku. Unsatisfactoriness or dukkha suffering and discontentedness. It is the distance that comes between us and something more or something less, 
that we're always wishing for. We translate dukkha often as suffering, discontentedness, unsatisfactoriness. What it really comes down to is there's something that comes between us and something we want more or something we want less of. That's really what dukkha comes down to. We're projecting my life would be better if whatever it happens to be, if this weren't occurring or if this were occurring. It is though we're destined to want something we cannot have and be rid of something that we're experiencing never to be fully satisfied. And this frustration to a greater or lesser extent is translated into an emptiness inside of us that makes us try to control our personal world and the world around us. And these are referred to as a three taken together. These three uh, things that you see on the screen now are referred to as the three marks of, exi of existence in Buddhist philosophy and are seen in the various elements of wabi-sabi. So we're going to do a, a little bit of a case study of how wabi-sabi is, is manifest in the culture. And we see in this chado, or the way of tea, and we can see here a person who's, who's preparing the tea. And one cannot discuss it without a brief excursion to Chado or Chan Yu, the tea ceremony. The serving of powdered green tree was introduced to Japan from China in the 12th century. The Japanese Buddhist priests who traveled to China to study the religious scriptures returned to their homeland having acquired new customs. Now, I want to add that, that this we're talking about powdered green tea now, which is specifically a specific form that's used for the, the tea ceremony. But tea itself was brought to Japan originally by monks centuries before to keep the monks awake while they were sitting meditation. <laughs> so so that just keep in mind, you know, having a cup of coffee before you meditate in the morning is not a bad thing necessarily. Mm -hmm. The priest Isai, uh, 1141 to 1215, was a Tendai monk and the founder of Rinzai Zen, a Buddhist sect, is credited with bringing to Japan the practice of drinking tea in its powdered form. And powdered green tea became an important feature of the monastic tradition. And as I said before, it was used as an aid for staying alert during long periods of meditation. From its origin in Zen ceremonies, the cultural practice known as Chanoyu emerged in its secular form during the 15th and 16th centuries. And a succession of tea masters were instrumental in the development of the Zen and the Zen priest, Murata Shukyo, who was in 1422 to 1502, who was responsible for formalizing the tradition in accordance with the Zen ideals. And Takano Jo in the, seven, the 16th century refined the art. But it was Sendikyu who established the form of Chanayu as it's known today. The guiding principles of Chanayo as expressed by Sen Rikyu are first harmony, harmony between guests, hosts, nature and setting. And this harmony is not one that's contrived. It's a natural ease that one cultivates. And respect, K, sincerity toward another, regardless of rank or status. It comes from the, an organic humility that is nurtured through practices. Third is purity, say, to spiritually cleanse, spiritually cleanse oneself to be of pure heart and mind. This is the embodiment of no sensation, conception, discrimination, awareness that we find in the Heart Sutra. And finally, tranquility, jaku, inner peace that results from obtaining the first three principles. This inner peace allows one to truly share. This, I don't think that there's a better description of equanimity that we talk about in, in uh, the four Brahma Vihara, for instance. It's fairly obvious how Buddhist teachings are demonstrated through the tea ceremony. In addition to these principles, the essence of Chanayu is embodied in the concept of Ichigo Ichi'e, literally one time, one meeting. This is the awareness that each tea gathering <clears throat> is a once in a lifetime event, never, never to occur again. For this reason, the sharing of a bowl of tea should be conducted 
with humble nature and utmost sincerity. It should be noted that a number of Tendai Buddhist monks practice Chandiyo today. Most, ne most notably, the next Yamoto or Grand Master of the Musho Koji Senkei School, that's one of the three uh, schools that descended from Master Sen, as well as Ichishima Sensei's son, Genshin, who has been practicing tea ceremony now for, well, we'll ask Ichishima Sensei when he comes up. I, I think it's been at least 10 years, but I'm not, I'm not really sure. So that means he's, he's beginning to get the hang of it. <laughs> Wabi-sabi aesthetics exemplified by Chado. And the first is the Chado of picture, tea bowl. And we're gonna talk about this in, in the next slide a little bit, but they're always hand thrown. And many of these bowls are hundreds of years old, revered for their age and crafts persons who created them. Ikebana. This is always seasonal and changes to reflect the people attending as well as the type of day and environment. This is like, this is like the, the pottery as an art in and of itself. It, I should, this is like the pottery that we saw and an Ikebana is an art in and of itself is what I'm trying to say. And then we have art itself usually plays in the Tokonomo, that's a raised platform providing a special space of importance in which are displayed ikebana, bonsai, a favorite piece of pottery, or an artistic or calligraphic scroll. And finally, the architecture. The tea room is a small room, often four to eight tatamis in size, so it's somewhere between 24 to 48 square feet in size, with a small opening in which the participants must literally crawl into the room you don't walk into the room, you crawl into the room. I don't, you see there a little door, and that door, I think you see a door. Do I see it up here? I can't really tell. Anyway, the door is only about this high. So in order to enter the tea room, you have to crawl into it. Um, and the reason one does that is to demonstrate their equality and their humility. They're on their hands and knees as they enter, and so everyone is at the same level when one goes in. With no furniture, it has a Takanamo with three elements, several Zabutan or cushions, the burner, teapot, tea bowls, and implements. And these elements are held together by the seasonality of their presentation, demonstrating the ephemeral and imper permanent nature of existence. The orderliness and discipline of the Chanayu is punctuated by the imperfect that is observed in their irregularities, asymmetry, and care of aged implements and the surroundings. One should realize that these elements of the tea ceremony are also accompanied by many other elements, such as kaiseki, a type of art form that balances the taste, texture, appearance, and colors of food. Only fresh seasonal ingredients are used and are prepared in ways that aim to enhance the flavor. The term literally means breast pocket stone. These kanji are thought to have been incorporated by Sen no Rikyu to indicate the frugal meal served in the austere style of Chanayu, the Japanese tea ceremony. The idea came from the practice where monks would war off hunger by putting warm stones into the front folds of their robes near their stomachs. Waka and other forms of Japanese poetry gained renown in Japan, originating from Buddhist monks in the courts that are also part of this tea ceremony. Let's look at, a, at an example outside of tea ceremony. And here we get into, uh, I think, some a better understanding of wabi-sabi. And that is in kitsuki. Kitsuki literally means golden joinery. It's the ap Japanese art of repairing broken pottery by mending the areas of breakage with lacquer, dusted or mixed with powdered gold, silver, or platinum. The method is similar to what's referred to as the Maka'e technique. As a philosophy, it treats breakage and repair as part of the history of an object rather than to disguise the object. Kintsugi becomes closely associated with ceramic vessels used for Chanyu uh, as a philosophy Kintsugi is a practical manifestation of the Japanese philosophy of wabi-sabi. Um, years ago, the Iomoto that I mentioned 
um, who is the next in line to be the Grand Master of the Tea Ceremony in Japan. When he, he has, he performed the Tea Ceremony here on uh, several occasions. And one of the, his favorite bowl for the tea is 250 years old. That looks something like the piece that's there in terms of being repaired, although that particular one was repaired several times. But that particular bowl is his favorite, not only because it's 250 years old, but because it had been repaired. Mm. In that sense, it had a history. It's not something that you just go to the shop and pick up and bring home and now use for, for whatever practical purpose. Um, and so the orderliness and discipline of the Chanayu is punctuated, as I said, by the imperfect and observed by the irregularity, asymmetry, and care of aged implements and the surroundings. One should realize that these elements of the tea ceremony are also accompanied by many other elements, such as kaiseki, a type of art form that balances the taste, texture, appearance and colors of the food. Oh, did I read this over here? <laughs> I did, I'm sorry. Um, oh, because I'm on Kintsuki, I went up to another point. <clears throat> um, we can also see that this concept being extended in Japan today, the concept of motenai encompasses the idea of respecting resources and not wasting them along with an inherent <clears throat> recognition of their value. And I'll repeat that term again. Motenai. Motainai, thank you. As sustainability becomes a global focus, the nuance of Motainai, Motainai offers an alternative frame for our link to the world and the items we are bringing into it. While many sustainable efforts focus on the future of the planet as a motivator, Motainai looks closely at the items themselves, believing that if you value an item in the first place, there is no cause for waste at all. In embracing of the flawed or the imperfect, Japanese aesthetic values marks the where by which the use by by the use of the object. This can be seen as a rationale for keeping the object around after, even after it's been broken or as a justification of Kintsugi itself. Highlighting the cracks and repairs as simply an event in life of an object rather than allowing its service to end at the time of its damage or breakage. Referring again to Moten Motainai's potential lies in the complex meaning which draws on ancient Buddhist beliefs. Nobel Prize winning Kenyan environmentalist Wangari Matai in 2005 writes, Motai comes from the Buddhist word that reflects to the essence of things. It can be applied to everything in our physical world, showing that objects don't exist in isolation, but are connected to one another. Tatsuo Nanai, chief of the official Motainai campaign in Japan, added that Nai is a negation, so Motainai becomes an expression of sadness over the loss of the link between two entities, living and non-living. <clears throat> Kintsuge is related to the Japanese philosophy of no mind, mushin, which encompasses the concepts of non-attachment, acceptable of change as an aspect of human life. Now, I want to point something out. When you walk into the hondo, uh, you look around and you might be, well, whatever you're experiencing is what you're experiencing. But I'm not sure that if you notice, it, or if you do know, I think everybody here probably knows, but that was a horse barn that we took down piece by piece and re-erected on a new foundation. It would have been much less expensive and taken us much less time to merely put up a new building. Putting up a new building would have cost us half as much, in fact, for the same size building. But we took that old horse barn and essentially did what is done in Kintsugi. We repaired it, 
But it's interesting because if you look closely, we didn't try to, re to hide the repairs. And everything was used. Even the floor of the old barn is now the front altar that you see in there. And when you think about that building, that's a different form of expression of Wabi Sabi. Yeah, yes. And there's always a reason why cultures evolve. And I'm wondering, like, were people very poor and therefore, hey, let's fix this thing instead of because I can't afford a new one. And therefore, they develop an appreciation for broken things. But that why would they use just gold and silver and platinum if it was just out of poverty? Well, this is the, <laughs> this is the question of like, what did it yeah. evolve from? I, I think I think I mean, it's 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 a good question. But I think in some cases it may be because, hey, we can't go buy a new one, so let's fix the one we've got, which is perfect. And therefore legitimate. those things become beautiful and because- Because, because they are, right? And they have a history, you know. My, my grandfather used this, for instance, you know, that sort of thing. But on the other hand, often it's done in a way that, that exemplifies or exalts the piece because of its history by using the gold and the silver in the case of the cuffs. You know, so I think both things can be true. It can be partly because let's repair this so we don't have to get a new one, but it can also be let's preserve this so that we maintain our relationship to it. I think both things are true. <clears throat> but that, that, that was a good question. Thank you. Um, as a way of approaching the world with Buddhist underpinnings, the first is recognize one's own imperfections, rather like wabi-sabi of the provisional self. You've heard me refer to Dr. Shomo Morita, who was a contemporary, was a contemporary of Freud's and the creator of the Morita therapy, which was influenced by Buddhism, stated the following. Give up on yourself. Give up on yourself. Begin taking action now while being neurotic or imperfect or a procrastinator or unhealthy or lazy or any other label by which you inaccurately describe yourself. Go ahead and be the best imperfect person you can be and get started on those things you want to accomplish before you die. That's a wabi-sabi statement of life. <laughs> None of us live in an objective world, but instead in a subjective world that we ourselves have given meaning to. The world you see is different from the one I see and is impossible to share your world with anyone else. That's Ichiro Kishimi. And this is relevant to the sphere of friendships and relationships. <laughs> Apart from being useless, hoping that our friends will meet our expectations is a surefire path of loneliness since we will get upset with them one by one and end up losing them. Expressions like, if I were you, I would have done this or that when we feel let down because we're hoping for a different response from them. And reality encapsulates a profound ignorance of the uniqueness of the human condition. And I want you to, I need to wrap this up. I want you to ponder this quote. To Taoism, that which is absolutely still and absolutely perfect is absolutely dead. For without the possibility of growth and change, there could be no Tao. In reality, there is nothing in the universe which is completely perfect or completely still. It is only in the minds of humans that such comments exist. And that's from Alan Watts. We'll be returning to that. In conclusion, the demands of modern life try to push us to be perfect. We're expected to achieve success, make money, become popular on social networks, constantly improve following advice of internet books and self-help gurus. And that is where the danger lies. If we become obsessed with perfecting our lives, we will end up full of the things we desire if we're lucky and arrogant and heartless without space to learn the truly important things in life in many other cases. 
Are we to look at the cherry blossoms only in full bloom, at the moon only when it is cloudless, branches about to bloom or gardens strewn with faded flowers are worthy of our admiration? And this is from Essays in Idleness by Kenko Yoshida. In other words, all stages and conditions of nature are beautiful and worthy of our attention, contemplation, and affection. In a world of mass production and consumerism, however, these connections to objects are difficult to maintain, highlighting, highlighting our increased distance from the environment we rely on. As Tatsuo Nanai wrote, people thought we were separate from our forests and oceans, that we were superior to nature. But the environmental crisis awakened our consciousness to the reality that we are part of nature. Wabi-sabi was born of Taoism further rooted in Buddhism and is expressed through aesthetics, form and function, philosophy and a way of life. It is the manifestation of what we attempt to approach as Buddhist living in a more complete and wholesome world. The primary lessons are that everything is imperfect, impermanent and incomplete in nature and we as humans are part of nature. Examining wabi-sabi is a meditation on shunyata. And these are some of the sources that I use that people would really like to know uh, what they are. I'm happy to provide a, a list of some of these. And, you know, I, I there's another phrase that I was, I was thinking of contemplating, and I'll, I'll read it to you. I didn't to make a slide of it. I watch the twi twinkling stars looking down at my hands as I take a, dip, a deep breath. A great pause emerges in eternity. I am stardust and at the same time consciousness. So, I'll open it up to mm -hmm. <laughs> Questions and but before I do that, I'm going to ask Ichishima Sensei. And we're going to unmute folks online. Hi, Sha. Just seeing you. Yeah. Uh, Ichishima Sensei, uh, how how long has Genshin been been uh, practicing Chanyu? I think over 10 years or so, uh, he's very interested in such uh, culture of Wabi and Sabi, and also relating to uh, classic uh, Chanoyu. Mm -hmm. And it, I think uh, Chanoyu is a very beautiful culture in Japan and uh, really expressing uh, Wabi and Sabi. Uh, someone translate negative sense of beauty for sabi, but uh, uh, I think uh, this is a very uh, relaxing uh, feeling of the atmosphere. Where, where, where whoever enters into a small uh, tatami room, they are all equal beyond any politics. Just discuss, uh, just uh, see. Uh, each other of uh, mind. This is kind of mind talk and silence and the uh, simplicity and this kind of uh, expression is, I think, appropriate to the Wabi and Sabi culture. And uh, the ceremony really uh, started by Sen no Rikyu, but uh, first, as you mentioned, uh, Esai, a Tendai Buddhist priest uh, who opened opened the Rinzai Zen later, but he's one of the lineage of uh, uh, Mikkyo, esoteric Buddhism, uh, Yojo Ryu. I think this is uh, very interesting that uh, he brought Chinese tea culture, uh, tea itself to Japan. And so <clears throat> uh, really, uh, I think, uh, appreciated by people at the time, still now, uh, your friend uh, uh, Mushakoji, uh, mm -hmm. saying, uh, and he he often visit you, and uh, he's also one of the uh, really interesting person of Chanoyu, and 
I think uh, uh, he studied also Tendai Buddhism very well. Uh, yes, this is, mm, yeah, uh, what I felt. Thank you. Thank you, Sensei. Hi. So, are there any questions? And I'll stop the recording. And, and we'll stop the recording right now.